Thank you, Dr. Altawani. So at this time, we're going to move to our implementation panel. Um, each of our panelists is going to give a brief overview of the context of their organizations or districts. And after that, we're going to engage in discussing across panelists some questions or considerations for implementation of biliteracy sales across the different uh, contexts. And as you're all listening, you can type in questions in the chat, and then we'll circle back to them at the end of the panel. And we're going to start off first by hearing from Tracy Cordero. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, my name is Tracy Cordero. I am the director of the Indigenous Montessori Institute, which is the teacher training program of the Karis Children's Learning Center. Um, my team and I are really excited that I could be a part of this discussion um, because we are in a very unique situation. We are an independent, nonprofit language revitalization school that uses the Montessori pedagogy to do education. We are located here in Cochiti Pueblo, New Mexico. And um, we um, are not affiliated with the state. So PED, we are not affiliated with RAL Southwest. And so it's really special for us to be here um, to share information about why this um, seal is so important. Um, as I mentioned, the Karis Children's Learning Center is a language revitalization school. Um, that uses the Montessori pedagogy. Um, there's a lot of prestige and elitism in Montessori, um, but that's not who we are. Um, because of what the history of education has been to Indian people, to indigenous communities, we know that school has been the trauma that has taken language from us. It's a boarding school era, after that, and then even in Head Start, where there's such a strong push for English only, English literacy, value of the written word, and heck with your oral languages. Um, and so we are using the same tool, um, education, to restore and revitalize our heritage language of Keras. Um, and though we're not a affiliated with PED, um, this is the still is important to us because it validates it honors the languages of our communities. It honors the wisdom that is embedded in our language that has been passed down to us for generations. Um, and so this graphic outlines our key programs at KCLC. Um, KCLC, um, we do school. So we right now serve children ages 3 to 12 years old. We have a parent seminar. We have a mentor apprentice immersion program, outdoor classroom, and a native language symposium. All of these things are done in Keras. Um, so language, language, language. Um, and then because we needed teachers to be able to fulfill our school teaching positions, we created the Indigenous Montessori Institute. And our teacher training methods are rooted in those same values of language that our school operates from. Through IMI, we do advocacy. Um, so moving away from English as the standard, our languages come with enough wisdom and knowledge to stand on their own. We do professional development and technical assistance aligning to what I just said. And then we do teacher training that is rooted in both Montessori pedagogy, but um, more so in the philosophy of indigenous education. Um, and so, through our institute, through our teacher training program, we hope to reclaim the education of our children through the teacher training. We want to continue to promote the inherent right to exercise educational sovereignty among our tribal nations. Um, and we want to restore our own indigenous knowledge systems as the foundation for building all forms of indigenous education. We um, work really hard to disrupt and dismantle systems of white supremacy culture in indigenous education. And that system of white supremacy culture is what says English first, English only. Um, and so our school provides a pathway. Earlier, Sam said other supports that are needed are dual language education, other models to sustain bilingual education, and heritage and world language programs. And that's what we are. And so we need advocacy to support the work that we're doing. So ultimately, our babies at our school 
can grow up um, 18 high school graduates and get this skill, not because of the nice skills you have, but because it's inherent to who they are as Coach T people. Um, so everything we folks, wait, is this my slide? It is. Okay, I can't read this because this is not our graphic. So I'm sorry that ours is not up to par here to show as was. Um, but basically, everything that we do in terms of language is tied to our community. And we work really hard to pull from the expertise in terms of language um, and education that already exists in our communities. Um, and so the first thing that needs to happen to support these, these bilingual, biliteracy skills is a paradigm shift about the value of our language. And we see those policies in um, English uh, second language learners, English language learners. Um, and as indigenous people in early grades, we know that the English is tutored away from us. And so we want to ensure that as a system, our language is being supported so that it's not a contradiction to go after this biliteracy, bilingual skill as a 12th grader when starting pre-K up until high school, our language wasn't the standard. Our language wasn't good enough. So this skill is really about equity. It's about doing education in a way that's meaningful, not just to the outside standard of achievement and success, but to our way of life. It's about equity and sustaining a sovereign nation who's dependent on this language to be here. I think that might be the end of my time. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over now to Jessica. Thank you so much, Tracy. My name is Jessica Villalobos, and I'm the Senior Director for the Department of Language and Cultural Equity with Albuquerque Public Schools. Uh, just as Tracy said, we are also very excited to be part of this conversation. Um, and as she said, the main goal and priority really is about equity and access. In an effort to recognize <laughs> In an effort to recognize the academic achievements and efforts of bilingual students in Albuquerque Public Schools, while simultaneously highlighting the benefits of bilingualism and biliteracy, it is with great honor that our uh, school district recognizes all participants in language programs across the district in, in grades K through 12, in accordance with state-mandated regulations for the state field of bilingualism and biliteracy, as well as the district Spanish seal and other foreign language seals. Furthermore, Albuquerque Public Schools recognizes that bilingualism is an asset that all students should be encouraged to acquire in our ever-changing world. In achieving this recognition, it is our hope that our students' bilingual identities will be supported and validated as they develop an understanding of their heritage as well as the opportunities that bilingualism affords them. We understand that we can never measure the level of satisfaction and pride that students feel for their bilingualism as it will evolve throughout the rest of their lives. In a world in which boundaries of our global community are ever expanding, Albuquerque Public Schools assures students, their families, and the community that their languages and cultures are embraced and also welcomed. So here are just a few of the program goals and many of our co-presenters already went through some of these. Um, but one of the goals is definitely to encourage the study of language. Albuquerque Public Schools has 75 schools who offer language programs uh, to which 600 teachers provide those services, or more than 600 teachers provide those services to approximately 1,500 students, K through 12. Uh, we identify graduates with language and biliteracy skills. We prepare our students for 21st century skills. Uh, but I think most importantly, we recognize and value the native and foreign language instruction in our schools and affirm the value of diversity in a multicultural and multilingual society. I do want to emphasize that these goals are just part of the larger goals that we have for our bilingual programs that are state funded, uh, one being bilingualism and biliteracy, uh, two being high academic achievements in uh, two or more languages, 
and social cultural competence, where all stakeholders in Albuquerque Public Schools work to defend students' rights to access diverse curriculum and instructional materials and validating families' home language, languages and dialects. So with that said, we are a fairly large district. We do offer over six fields, and I'll start with uh, the elementary and middle school field that you see there on your left-hand side. As Mr. Aguirre said, from the minute those students walk into our doors, uh, pre-K and kindergarten, we want to make sure that we are strengthening our bilingual program and ensuring that we are leveraging the assets of our students' language and culture. And so students in elementary schools that are enrolled in dual language programs in grades five or grades eight are also eligible to receive a district seal. Um, those students must reflect at least a minimum of three hours of programming in another language other than English. So we are very honored that uh, just recently we were able to award fifth graders and eighth graders uh, just a couple years back. Our next seals are high school graduation seals. And we'll start with the uh, larger program, which is our district Spanish bilingual seal. This is the most rigorous uh, biliteracy seal that we offer, simply because we require a total of 16 credits uh, during their high school career to attain this seal. So we're looking at eight English credits and eight uh, content credits in another language. We, at this point, only offer uh, Spanish as that language, as we offer a variety of coursework for our students to be able to achieve um, and earn that seal as it is very uh, rigorous. The next uh, seals that we do offer, um, speaking of equity and access, we wanted to offer a variety of seals for students who are also not part of our bilingual program. As Dr. Elatwani um, went over the New Mexico State Seal of Bilingualism and Biliteracy, um, I'm not going to go over that again, but we definitely offer uh, that seal as well. And at the end, a global seal of biliteracy, where students complete their English language arts credit requirements as well as meet a level of proficiency in another language via a stamp assessment, uh, which the public education department provides. Um, and you see the different categories there to the different types of seals. Um, just going back real quick to the district seal, I do want to note that we also offer a Spanish seal of distinction for our graduates who achieve a 3.5 GPA or higher. Um, with that said, just uh, uh, last year, 2019-2020, uh, these are our numbers of seals that we were able to award. Um, and so you'll see the elementary, middle school numbers, and then you'll also see our high school numbers, which were a total of, I believe, 1,420 seals district-wide, which is quite, uh, quite a recognition. It was a definitely record-setting year for us. Um, with uh, that said, I am going to turn it over to Santi Gutierrez from Clovis Municipal School. Thank you. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are from the eastern part of the state, New Mexico. And we, um, just a couple of uh, figures, uh, numbers at a glance, so you get an idea as to what we have working with. We are a population of about 39,000 or so. Um, 8,200 of those are, are students in our different schools. And we have about an average of 400 students that graduate every year. Uh, with that being said, that's broken down by 14 elementaries, three middle schools, two high schools, and two uh, what we would consider specialty schools. That would be early college and an I academy. Um, this give you. This is going to give you a, a little bit of an idea as to you know I'm not going to go over the the the. Of course, the benefits of the COE, we all agree that there are many, but this gives you an idea as to what it looks like in a fairly small um, uh, district, school district. Um, we, these are the numbers that we've come across from uh, 2015 when we first uh, started implementing the actual uh, the New Mexico uh, bilingual seal. And, and we've kind of gradually grown. Uh, we also have added uh, German. Uh, to what those languages that you see on the screen. 
And so we're quite, quite proud of that. Of course, with Spanish still being the highest number that we have. So what does that look like for um, our neck of the woods? We have our um, bilingual SEAL um, students. They must obviously apply for the SEAL. But how do they hear about it? We do the usual of advertising via uh, email and push it out through our information system to everyone, uh, specifically, of course, to the high school. Uh, but we do take the time to reach out to those uh, eighth graders that are going to be incoming ninth graders and um, start that early as ninth grade and kind of start helping them out, lay out their path in what would be the best option for them. Um, as you can see, the four options are still the same uh, for us. We, at this point, only offer the New Mexico State Bilingual Seal. Um, because due to uh, the credit, we're not able to offer those additional uh, classes that some of our other schools are able to. And so this works for us, and uh, uh, we keep growing. So as you can see, we have um, the, the different credits that could be earned. Uh, we only have up to Spanish 3. So if that student would like the fourth credit, which would be for the units of credit plus assessment or units of credit in the presentation, they would have to pick up that additional credit either as a college uh, credit or uh, with the Spanish language arts uh, that we offer through our bilingual education program. Uh, we do have a bilingual education program at two of our elementary, uh, one of our middle schools, and um, both of our, our high school. And so that is an, uh, an option uh, for them. As you saw earlier, we only have one high school. And we have a freshman academy. So all students um, that are going to go through the school system in Clovis, New Mexico, will go through those two particular schools. So they do have that opportunity if they wish uh, to go that route. The portfolio presentation, this is a little more detail as to what that entails. Um, you know, it's fairly simple. It is. 15 minutes, the students are given a, a topic ahead of time, obviously, and they're given the rubric uh, that shows what's the expectation and what we are hoping to accomplish. They will submit a writing portion of it as well as the actual presentation. We've been doing those presentations virtually, and that has actually worked out quite well. Um, we are very fortunate that we have a military base. And that has been helpful when we've needed um, uh, foreign language or languages other than Spanish. We uh, have uh, reached out to um, actual uh, preacher, and he helped us uh, with a couple of those languages as well. They don't come very often, but when they do, we really uh, try to uh, look for people that can help us. Um, so let's see, upon graduating, the students, uh, we you can see that beautiful picture of those girls. That was from 2018. And they all receive a stole. And we, um, we have them embroidered. And they are theirs to keep, as well as a certificate. I believe one of our questions earlier was, how do we, um, you know, do they put it on the diploma or the transcript? Um, we emboss the diploma. And then, of course, we. Um, add um, a couple of lines that show that the student has received the bilingual, the New Mexico State Bilingualism and Biliteracy seal. So um, they get those as well. And so that was it. That, that really wraps up our whole, um, a whole a bilingual seal that we um, are able to give our students in uh, COVID New Mexico. So thank you. Thank you, Santi, and, and thank you to all our presenters. It was really great just getting an overview of the, the various contexts and, uh, you know, the, the different ways and the, the work going in on across the state. Um, at this time, we have some questions that we want to ask across the different panelists. And, uh, and also, of course, if there's something that is applicable, um, you know, to Dr. al Atwani, in terms of the work at NMPED, too, we, we invite her participation as well. Um, the first question that I, I want to um, present to the panelists, and, and maybe I could ask uh, Tracy to take on the first one, and then we can op open up to the panelists, is, you know, I want to ask about, you know, how the SEALs can create bridges to students' heritage backgrounds and empower students to engage in their communities. Um, you know, Tracy, hearing some of your points talking about those foundations for Indian 
indigenous education, um, and, and maybe think of that. So if you could just talk about that, how maybe those seals can create bridges to those students' heritage background and empower students. Um, I'll, I'll, I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Tracy, do you have do you have sound? Um, can you all hear me now? I thought I I was unmuted on my end. Yeah, we hear you now. Okay. Um, the seal is one of the only ways that the Western education system validates our languages. Um, and so when we think of equity, when we think of bridging those gaps that have been intentionally created by outside education systems, um, it's, it's pretty much the least that can be done. Um, and so in, in our homes, in our communities, our heritage languages are the first languages. And then for generations, we've gone to school where that has been um, punished for older generations for speaking our languages. Um, now we see the punishment as um, written language being golden, um, so the, the stress on the importance of the written word. And for us, our language is only oral. Um, and so there's nothing in the public school system right now that validates our method of teaching and learning, which is, our, which is through our language. Um, and so having that seal um, attached to your high school diploma can be um, a super meaningful thing for our students, for our tribal governments, who are sovereign nations, um, and, and probably most importantly to our grandmas and grandpas because of how powerful and loving and meaningful our languages is, are, um, and, and that still being one of the few ways that it's validated by that education system that is not ours. Thank you. Jessica or Santi, do you have anything to add to that in terms of yeah. skills creating bridges to students' heritage uh, backgrounds and empower, empowering them? If I may add, can you hear me? Hello, can yeah. you hear me? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, so um, I I I love what Tracy was saying, and, and we really try hard in. Um, in our district to make sure that our students view the seal as a way, um, not just as a way to promote that foreign language or the world language, but it, um, if we provide those different pathways uh, for non-native English speakers to demonstrate that proficiency. And, and obviously with what the state has set up and what the different stakeholders has um, been able to help that, that allows us in our district to show that um, a lot of times to our students in that bilingual education programs that would otherwise not be recognized for having that um, that additional gift that a lot of times is seen as um, maybe not such an asset. And so we are working really hard in promoting that. And, you know, uh, a while back we had our, our director's meeting and we were able to see what different uh, districts, school districts are, show, are doing to promote in, um, promote their bilingual program, but more specifically the bilingual seal. And that was such an eye-opener and, and we grabbed a lot of ideas that we're hoping to implement, but that's, that's what we're doing. Thank you. If I can add to that real quickly. Um, I think these, all of these seals of biliteracy really help our students engage with the community, uh, number one, by instilling a pride in their background, their heritage, being proud of who they are, where they come from, the languages they speak. Um, but at the high school level, we also have a component in the portfolio that is dedicated completely to community and community service where students present on that as well as write an essay on that and I think that really brings them back and engages them with their their heritage um, and every portfolio is, is very different but we really honor the fact that uh, we assess our students holistically with that and uh, it, it's amazing how much that connects them to their um, heritage background thank you great can, can you all talk about how um, stakeholder perspectives are, are used to shape implementation in the course requirements, such as like tribal, family, community, or student voices? Oh, 
or is that a place where you know you all could still you're still figuring out how to do that? Yeah, for Arellano, for Albuquerque Public Schools, we have a, a bilingual field committee at every level, elementary, middle school, and high school. And uh, these stakeholders come from a variety of diverse backgrounds, as well as a variety of diverse positions, such as teachers, students, principals, and district office personnel. And that uh, committee meets every couple of weeks for the high school component. And for the elementary, middle school, they meet quarterly to really assess, modify, um, shape that implementation or the course requirements or course needs. Um, in addition to um, just having an ongoing conversation on how we can improve as a district. Great. Yeah. Tracy, I'm wondering about at, at the at the CARES uh, Children's Learning Center, how do you get various input in terms of, you know, the model that you guys are working with and building with? How do you all get um, input from the community? For, for us, the foundation of everything that we do starts and ends with the blessing and permission of our tribal council. Um, and so once we have gone through the appropriate protocols to gain blessing and approval to operate, um, we always continue, we always operate from the approach that our language is first, the intellectual property of the tribe. And so we also hope that that is how the outside world sees it as intellectual property. Um, and so it belongs to us. And um, and with that in mind, um, one of our one of our values is um, a responsibility to the community. And so, since this language belongs to us as a people, it takes um, community meetings, it takes parent meetings, it takes meetings with tribal council members, and it takes um, community building in each of these different sectors. Um, so that we nurture and promote a sense of belonging in the work that we are doing um, and that we rely on the value of relationships and responsibilities to one another so that when we do language revitalization work, um, we all have learning and teaching to do in that lane and we have a responsibility to pass it to the younger generation. Great, thank you. I'm wondering if any of the panels can jump in. If you could talk about just some of the benefits that you all are seeing, you know, anecdotally, um, when students are in school or even after they graduate, um, you know, you all have shared how, and you know, even um, the presentation that we saw from NMPED, how these biliteracy cells have grown over the past couple of years. And um, so, what are you seeing in terms of um, benefits from students, or what are you hearing? If I may start, um, well, I, I can tell you that in our um, in our district, w because we start so early in talking to our eighth graders, incoming ninth graders, before they actually uh, fill out their um, classes for the next year, we're able to help them. Um, kind of set their path if they're wanting. We, we truly, truly uh, encourage students to not only take those Spanish classes, but definitely uh, be part of the bilingual program if uh, um, Spanish specifically is their, uh, their first language. And so because of that, they're able to really plan their classes accordingly and until the very, um, until their 12th graders. Um, I can tell you that uh, some of the, the comments we've gotten was that they were glad that they knew ahead um, early on. And for those students that join us later, um, you know, they're kind of um, left with uh, fewer options in how to attain that bilingual seal. I can honestly tell you specifically, I remember one of our students going back to Mexico and um, coming back and telling us, that because of that specific, um, because of getting their bilingual seal, they were able to take that certificate and, and, and I guess show it as proof that they were truly bilingual. 
and so they were able to attain a, a, a better job um, that way. So that was kind of neat to get that information uh, from them after they had left or they had graduated. So. Fantastic. Dr. Arellano, for Albuquerque Public Schools, um, I can just anecdotally tell you as a director and also um, as a teacher, the, the students are very vocal about the benefits of this, but we have seen our students go on to Ivy League schools such as Duke, Stanford, Harvard, and you name it, uh, who, who graduated with the SEAL. However, one of the really nice things that we are seeing now is that we are growing our own. Um, we have hired several of our students as testing specialists, as teachers, and they are now in the field with us at Albuquerque Public Schools. And so we are definitely seeing um, the benefits of that um, for both parties. And so it's always great to, to be able to see our students come back and also uh, give back and become language teachers themselves. Also, you know, adding on um, the, the benefits of um, uh, receiving the state seal of bilingualism bilateracy or the, the seals of um, the, the bilateracy seal. Uh, in addition to mentioning the extrinsic values of being bilingual or being multi, multi, multilingual or multicultural, uh, when we are creating resources for our districts and or for our charter schools for the implementation of the state seal of bilingualism bilateracy, uh, we are um, being very careful to highlight that intrinsic part of uh, receiving the state seal of bilingualism bilateracy, which means that uh, recognizing that linguistic background and uh, recognizing our uh, students' heritage and letting our uh, and let our students feel um, safe in their identity and in their cultural background. Okay. So I know when we did that uh, poll earlier on. Um, one of the questions we asked was how many out there are already were in states or districts that had biliteracy skills um, or programs. And so I'm just curious if you guys could give some any lessons learned for someone, you know, about getting your biliteracy skill process going. Um, and then I and even Tracy, in, in your case, um, it, it's a little bit different. But I would even love to hear your thoughts on because you're 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 getting a whole sort of teacher training program going around, um, you know, the, the language instruction piece. So I would love to hear your thoughts on, on that piece as well. I'm sorry, can you repeat the beginning of that? It just cut out. Yeah, sorry. So just any lessons learned about for those that maybe are, are getting a bullet by literacy field process going in their school or district, and maybe in your case, Tracy, as you, you all are working on um, you know, the teacher training component around around the language instruction. Um, just any lessons learned that you would have for those out there that are trying to get something started? Sure. Um, a couple of things that come to mind first is that um, each tribe and the language of that tribe is different. Um, different, even though it's the same language, the dialects are different, and, and those are intellectual properties of the tribe and should be treated that way. So you should not do anything with the tribal language without having explicit permission of the tribe's language you're intending to work with. Um, I would also say um, that each tribe has different um, uses of the language. And so a clear understanding around what the tribe's values around the languages might be. For instance, can, it, can you write it or not? For us, we can't. Um, and so we wouldn't implement a teacher training program that promotes or or teaches Kara speakers how to read and write Kara. That totally goes against our value around our language. Um, and then I would also say um, to figure out what is the end goal of using the language. Is it um, bits and pieces of casual daily use? 
Is it just enough to get by? Is it phrases and numbers? Or is it fluency? Um, and because when you know what you're striving for, that helps to build the infrastructure that will allow that language to be nurtured to achieve that end goal there. Thank, Thank you. you. Would any of the other panelists like to address that about sort of lessons for getting a biliteracy field process going either in their state or district? I know uh, Clovis was one of the first districts to start their bilingual seal at the state level. We already previously had a district bilingual seal, but um, later on it became really helpful to be able to look at different schools' uh, websites and what they were doing to implement that at their level. I, I, I specifically recall looking at APS and just being amazed as to the number of just uh, different classes that they were able to offer specifically in Spanish. And and so, but I still got a lot of great ideas on how I can tailor that specifically to our school, to our district, excuse me, and, and make it work that way. But it was, it was eye-opening just to look at other schools and what they're doing for their bilingual field program because usually they post it out really detailed because a lot of our students need to have access to it and, and that's the way that they are able to access it. So I know that was very helpful to us. And I just want to put it out there, you know, is there something um, that you all want to share? Is there something about your process or program that you think works really well for your setting? And, you know, is there something that you think that you all could get better at? Dr. Arellano, for Albuquerque Public Schools, uh, what really works well is having everything reported to district office and having that verification take place at district office uh, because there is a lot of transcripts that need to be verified, uh, assessment scores, portfolio scores, um, and it is a lot of hard work on the school sites and therefore if district office has the personnel to, to take that on, that would be great. On the same token, um, I, I would have to say that providing the regalia for graduates um, at the district level so that the students aren't burdened with the cost or the school isn't burdened with the cost, that's been very successful uh, for us uh, because we award medals, stoles, pins. Um, we actually uh, do a lot of regalia to really honor our students and our graduates um, so that they are distinguished during their graduation ceremony. And so. Um, it, if your district office has a person or you are the person that coordinates that, um, that would really take that burden off of the school sites. Um, and uh, also the other piece of advice I would say is, is gather um, a list of community members that speak another language um, and have a list, a recurring list of these community members that schools can share and contact when you are doing, for example, portfolio process and you need three community members that speak um, Spanish or, uh, let's say, Karis, um, and then those schools can share that list. That has also well, been very successful. Also, to add, to add another advice um, for the, sti uh, for the um, okay. state of bilingualism by literacy implementation, I mean, um, we always encourage our districts and charter schools to bring the student leadership in the implementation of the state seal of bilingualism and biliteracy. And uh, we, we think that when they, bring this, when they bring that student leadership in the seal implementation, uh, they may have that pos positive reflection uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, the, on the seal numbers and also um, to have uh, many other languages as well. I think that's a really great piece of advice. Thank you. Okay, I just want to see if there's um, any last words of advice that you would, anybody um, or each of the panelists that you would like to share with participants before we leave. Um, 
this should be either related to your district or as you've gone through this process or things that you've learned along the way. Um, I do. Uh, you know, if you are on the fence or if your district's on the fence about doing this program, um, you really just have to look even just as far as when the students do their portfolio presentations. Uh, those of us that have been fortunate enough to be part of uh, those uh, presentations, you go away, I mean, just being amazed as to the stories of our students and just the, how far they've come and, and how hard they try. And when they're actually awarded and they have earned their bilingual seal, the pride of wearing that stolen graduation, uh, graduation time, and it's just a beautiful thing to see that. And of course, the majority of them, you know, they 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 don't want to lose that language. They don't. They want to. They're very happy and, and proud to be uh, recognized for it. And so I think at our district level, we are trying really, really hard to not only promote uh, the bilingual seal, but just um, acknowledge a lot of those students that perhaps. Uh, well, we know, not perhaps, but we know um, we're not really seen as having that additional language as a plus. And so it is an amazing, amazing program, and it is doable at every level, um, I can tell you. Um, I'm pretty much, um, you know, a one-woman show, and so when Albuquerque was talking about, um, Ms. Jessica was talking about, you know, having that point of contact, by default, I am it, and it makes a big difference just because you are able to manage um, a lot of the things that go on, but it's also a little bit hiring because you're you're it, you're responsible for everything. But you know that's at a, at a rural type of, of uh, community, and so if you're able to disperse some of that um, um, help for somebody else to to be able to give you the help, that would be greatly um, helpful for the program as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Everybody else. And I'm looking through the chat. Um, I do see there's a question. Um, OK, yeah, and I think Jessica already answered it um, about uh, the, the seals offered in the district. Yes, um, the, the APS offers both the state seal and the global seal. OK, um, I think that's all uh, the questions that we have. So. I want to thank the panelists again. This was really great getting to hear from everybody and just getting to hear the different work going on um, across the state and getting to hear the different ways um, that it's implemented. So thank you, everybody. We really appreciate it. Um, so uh, we are going to um, uh, be moving on. We want to ask everybody to complete a stakeholder feedback survey. We're going to put a, a link in the chat box. Uh, we really do appreciate hearing from everybody. So, um, you know, once we put that, we uh, we do have we put that survey link in there. So, if everybody could just take a moment to complete it after this webinar, we would really appreciate it. Um, and if we can move on to the next slide, we just want to give you quick some information about the Ross Southwest website. You know, go ahead and check us out. You can get some quick answers to your research questions. Um, there's some resources such as, such as an Ask Arel on there. You can, um, our website also gives an overview of some of our studies. It has some great infographics, some of the videos that we mentioned today, and some of our published reports. So we're always updating it with new stuff, so it's great to check it out. And then um, next slide. If you're interested in any of the research studies that we um, talked about today, they're also there. So when you get a hold of these slides, you can also look those up. And then our last slide. So if you want to connect with us, learn more about the Ralph Southwest and our programs, visit our website, subscribe to our Twitter feed, or sign up for any of our newsletters or publications, um, here's our information. And then I think that's about it um, on our last slide. We really thank you for taking your time and joining us today. We know it's a busy time of year. Everybody's so busy. So uh, we really thank you for um, all your great feedback in the chat box and your questions and your uh, being interactive. So we thank you for joining us today and have a good afternoon.